the pace with which the world today is moving with its growing complexities is somewhat not unknown to most of us however what is most intriguing is our ignorance our utter ignorance of where it is taking us the modern world wears a new look thanks to science with its technological advancements and control over the physical world and its loss at in spite of all the acquaintance and the control over the physical loss the law of all law the law of dharma still remains elusive undiscovered misunderstood and if i can say uncared for dharma is a grand concept and everyone swears by dharma but no two individuals agree as to what constitutes dharma dharma is bristled today with difficulties and confusions both theoretical and practical in the studio today we have two eminent and illustrious personalities who will be illumining this path of dharma and clear our certain doubts and hesitations in our minds sri ram prabhu charandas maharaj is from the international society of krishna consciousness or iscon previously with the iscon sri lanka movement he has now completely attached to the iscon movement in salem where they are building a mammoth granite all granite temple in salem itself along with sri gokul das prabhu maharaj they are doing a lot of prachars on dharma throughout the country and abroad swami ji has been initiated by his holiness bhakti vikas swami who himself is a disciple of his holiness srila prabhupada we extend our warm welcome to you swami ji the other dignitary in the studio is dr m r venkatesh he is a very popular face and he is a very regular panelist in almost all the prime shows in the national television he is also a very renowned and accomplished columnist in large media publications in india he is an advocate an expert on criminal laws on economic offenses serious financial frauds and anti money laundering guidelines for many who are not aware he has also passed his chartered accountancy with an all india ranking he is a doctorate he is a visiting faculty in many professional educational institutions and he has authored several books his recent book which was published in 2021 retaining balance the eternal way was acclaimed widely even by the policy makers of this country we extend a very very warm welcome to dr m r venkatesh i know he likes to be addressed as dr m r v swami ji when we say that dharma is that which upholds the order of this cosmos it gives us and reveals to us the idea of sustainability but from a different perspective we find that the same dharma keeps declining and from time to time needs reinstatement always when dharma is a sustainable value why does it become unsustainable when applied and declining when practiced hare krishna the uh, uh, thanks dr harish ji first of all you have set the tone for this entire discussion dharma the word dharma is actually a very very uh, a generic term fortunately today the word dharma has been uh, become a common word across the world there was this uh, you know even through various organizations even the advent of uh, the indian civilization over the west the word dharma has become like a common word which is used across the globe there was this famous novel which was written and became a best seller in 1980s called dharma bombs you know it was very famous it talks about dharma in a very uh, esoteric way so the word dharma has already become very common now the point as you correctly said 
is that the word dharma has a lot of connotations to it as well even from a vedic perspective generally what dharma means if you have to broadly bifurcate into two is one it's called nature nature means prakriti or the nature of the soul or nature of ourselves that's called dharma to tell you an example what is the dharma of sugar dharma of sugar is to be sweet what is the dharma of a chili the dharma of chili is to be spicy to be hot so there is some dharma for the soul as well we are all spirit souls so there is some dharma of the soul as well so that is what in broader terms it is called dharma as a nature or the nature of the soul the other commonly used term for dharma is about our duty our duty what is our duty say for example the spirit soul has some duty to perform and what is that duty and why is that duty more important for achieving the ultimate goal of life so these two things has to be understood from a very broad perspective to understand dharma in a collective term now when you asked about this thing that you know dharma is declining and dharma has been misunderstood people are not able to understand it in a very true sense even from a vedic perspective the decline of dharma starts as shrimad bhagavatam always quotes this in the first canto that dharmo dharma dharma kantasya na labo artasya labate that when you actually focus dharma for some artha artha means for some sense gratificatory needs or the needs of your bodily whims then dharma becomes misused dharma is only for apavargasya apavargasya means it is only used for mode of liberation or mode of achieving the primary goal or the ultimate goal or the paramo dharma this is what we call it so today as i have to put it that we have actually taken this word dharma or the duty of our self to be more of sense gratificatory in nature and that is where the decline has started this is just to give you a perspective to conclude to your uh, question is also that in vedic times even from the vedic scriptures we see that there is always there is cycle see vedic time is always cyclical it's not linear so the four yugas satya yuga treta yuga dwapara yuga and kali yuga comes once again in a cyclic format so the dharma has four legs to it as it's always been understood from vedic perspective it's called daya purity austerity and renunciation these four limbs of dharma keeps reducing every 1/4 or 25% in each yuga satya yuga had all these four limbs properly being maintained in treta yuga it reduced by 25% in dwapara yuga it reduces by 50% and in kali yuga it's already reduced already by 75% so it is already on the decline by i would say not by design but by you know the uh, historical uh, way in which it has been doing and even that's what we learn from bhagavad gita krishna says yata yada hi dharmasya glanir dharmasya glanir means when the dharma is on the decline either i come myself or send my representative so dharma sometimes you know on as a medium of uh, uh, time it always starts declining and that is where our vedic scriptures helps us to bring it back to its ultimate the substance as swami ji pointed out is that dharmic guidelines should not be followed blindly and used for sense gratification that means the subtleties of dharma are very difficult for one to comprehend and therefore requires one to be very very reflective and practice careful discernment when applying it to the principles of religion dr mrv is dharma then an exclusive and privileged doctrine of the hinduism or can it be extended beyond religion so to go back to where uh, swami ji left i would say that uh, dharma by itself as a propensity to go down as uh, swami ji said and that is absolutely religious agnostic in the sense you cannot pinpoint dharma as if it is only linked to hindus or hinduism there is everybody has got a dharma and everybody every religion has got its own dharma 
Now, if you are a true fellow, of a follower of a particular religion, your dharma is to follow that religion. Now, you cannot take this concept into a religion. This concept is a trans-religious concept. So, that is why this land has been able to absorb any religion like a bowl of milk can absorb any amount of sugar. This, this takes any religion, any type of philosophies, including agnostics, including Nastikas also. And, and you are able to carry on centuries after centuries because you are wedded to a root concept. The root concept as Swami, I, I, Swamiji is there, so I don't want to elaborate much more on what he has said. But the root concept is dharma is what is uh, ordained as a duty. The duty that you do, and there can be say, I or Swamiji cannot lift a gun and shoot a person. That that that's not our duty, and that's not bestowed on us. But an army man definitely has a duty to stop a person, and he can kill. Killing is also a duty, and that is a dharma. Whereas for me, it's a different dharma. For Swamiji, it's a dharma. For you, Harish, it's a different dharma. So dharma is what one experiences, and to me. Personally, it will be a constant conversation with your conscious that guides the dharma. Right or wrong, Harish, you may not know what is right for me or wrong for me, but I know with, in a deep conversation with my conscience that I know what is right and what is wrong. And if my conscience says that this is right and I go ahead and do it, I think it's perfectly a dharmic act. Because my conscience will not permit me to do something which is not dharmic. Because consciousness is not something that is uh, material, it is, uh, it is spiritual, it is trans uh, uh, your physical manifestation. So it comes from the divine. So divine constantly, divine cannot be there, everybody, everybody cannot have a blessings of an acharya, everybody cannot have a blessings of a guru or a swamiji right next to you, you know, you can't be doing this. But it's a GPS system embedded in your own uh, self that guides you, navigates you on a day-to-day -day, uh, mundane things also as to what you should do, what you shouldn't do. That is why uh, our system says Artha, Kama, Dharma, Moksha. The ultimate aim is Moksha, to be manifest with the Lord Himself, that, that you, begin, you become the Lord itself. But for which Artha and Kama are not supposed to be, you know, you don't have to be wearing an artificial poverty or, or, or you have to necessarily be subjecting yourself to hunger or pangs of it. You don't have to do all these things. Artha and Kama, provided they are in, within the realms of Dharma. And what is that Dharma? I don't have to define to you. You know what it is because there is a Lord who guides you. So, even to the most uh, agnostic person, there is a constant conversation if he has with his spiritual self, I think that will guide him to dharma. So what I gather from what Dr. MRV says is that dharma is universal. Yet, like what Swamiji says, it cannot remain a stationary system. And again, like what Dr. MRV says, that dharma has no single meaning and that stands unchanged despite context. Swamiji, then how can dharma prove itself capable of embracing and welcoming the whole modern development? In present times, how can we be sure and know when an action is truly dharmic? What is the method by which people today can perhaps fulfill the best versions of themselves and yet allow dharma to be the operational factor behind that? Yeah, the uh, important point which uh, Dr. M. R. V. put across is that the Dharma is uh, religious agnostic or religious neutral. See, what happens is, that's a very, very important point. Today, the uh, uh, ground reality or what you call the common man on the ground thinks that when you speak about Dharma, the connotations is misunderstood to be associated with one religion. Unfortunately, it is not. See, Dharma, as he correctly said, is actually everybody has to do it, irrespective of whether you are from this religion or that religion or whether you are young, old or whether you are male, female or whether you are, you know, rich, poor or across caste, across, you know, uh, sections of society. So the point which you ask now is that how do one know that, you know, this is the uh, ultimate Dharma which I have to perform? In uh, this question which you have asked now, it's not new. 
this question was asked 5000 years ago on in the naimisharanya when many of the sages uh, you know got together and they put the same question across to suta goswami so today after 2023 i mean 5000 years after that also the same question is getting repeated and the answer is still the same you know even though we can say that you know time has changed or you know the answers of those times would not be applicable today need not be the same questions are repeating and what he answered is the same answer which even applicable today the answer is savai pumsam paro dharmo yato bhaktir adokshaje ahai tuki apratihata ye atma suprasidati it actually is a very few words are there but it has a very deep meaning savai pumsam paro dharmo pumsa means for human being pumsa means human being savai pumsam savai means certainly paro dharmo which means the ultimate dharma or the best dharma or a dharma which one has to perform okay what it says savai pumsam paro dharmo yato bhaktir adokshaje so a bhakti or surrender or some actions in some you know the uh, uh, religious activity or what you call for an ultimate good has to be performed to adokshaja lord krishna third and fourth line are even more important that when one will know that he has performed the ultimate good the last line says he would be suprasidati suprasidati means he becomes blissful he becomes happy he becomes that yes i have done this i have helped somebody i have gone to the temple i have done this service i have been a volunteer for this i have given up everything and what's the third line says ahai tuki apratihata what it means is i am not expecting anything in return ahai tuki apratihata means i am not even expecting anything for you know for this goal i am doing that you know i am doing it for my name i am doing it for my fame or for position or money that is not dharma that is why i first answered when dharma becomes attached to some material concept then it would not give you suprasidati when it is actually done in a very highest sense as he was putting across then what will happen is it will automatically give you that you know blissful nature that you know i am doing something good that is all somebody will know that yes i am performing dharma if dharma then is the mode of conduct most conducive for spiritual growth of individuals then can it be said that those actions and guidelines would be considered dharmic only to the point that they support spiritually uplifting endeavors would that be a limiting factor for dharma's application in the context of the present world dr mrv please first you must understand dharma is the most secular concept it is the most secular it is probably more secular than the constitution of india okay second thing to see this world as between sacred or spiritual on one hand and carnal and secular on the other hand is basically not a traditional hindu way or in indian way or indic way of looking at it for us the spiritual world is intertwined with the secular world the secular world is intertwined with the spiritual world now i'll give you a classical example the coconut that you take into a temple and break it for uh, uh, auspiciousness is according to the courts in india sacred till you take it to the temple and it becomes non sacred or or what i call it as a as a secular one once it is broken and given as prashad now the same idea for us is it is prashad for the lord before you break it once you break it it is prashad for the lord and after that consumption for us it's only the sequence is uh, there so how can you say that uh, the coconut is sacred or uh, secular you cannot say that to answer your question that we are having a very very clear path that there is nothing called spiritual world there is nothing called uh secular world so you cannot be uh, adhering to dharma in your spiritual world alone without adhering to dharma in your secular world the role to spiritual world is intertwined with the role in your secular world so you have to be dharmic that is why artha kama is dharma so so even dharma has to assist kama and uh, artha because without dharma practicing kama or artha 
be is not something that is what swami ji alludes to that you see you cannot be a stand alone exercise it has to be an integrated intertwined exercise and the last goal is moksha moksha is not one that you have to start at the age of 18 you perform the role of a brahmacharya you perform the role of a grihastha then you perform the role of a vanaprastha then you see what you achieve as a uh, except for people who have taken to sanyas there there is a sanyasa uh, rule that that applies separately but generally if you are earning wealth through dharma honestly with all means paying your taxes it is on your path to moksha now there is nothing spiritual about it but there is everything spiritual about it if you ask a westerner he will say it is secular exercise for us it is as much a spiritual exercise as it is a secular exercise so let us not uh, in, uh, you know put a differentiation factor let us put a, a integral factor and see that these are all intertwined so that's a very very inclusive concept yes. of the dharma uh, from a point of view of it becomes easier to understand of whatever you do will be dharma or adharma in the sense whatever you do has to be in two buckets it cannot be secular and communal or secular and spiritual you cannot put into a different bucket you have to look at it whether what you do is it dharmic is it adharmic this is the question that you have to ask that was brilliant dr mrv but by and large india is following the model of the western civilization which speaks and is presented as a universal paradigm thus creating a myth that modern progress means to get rid of backwardness and what does backwardness mean backwardness refers to all those traditional cultural ways this is the prevailing myth that perhaps pervades the entire world not india alone so when anything and everything which is eternal cultural and traditional is is spoken it just gets reduced to blind beliefs and dharma therefore remains as an old probably immortal but still locked up in historical epics of india swami ji can you kindly throw light on a living on an existing present day model of dharma is it possible for any institution or place to for that matter to become a living explanation of this abstruse philosophy of dharma in today's times yes of course the uh, in the traditional way also there has been a lineage by which dharma has been uh, uh, given from one generation to another generation that is where puranas itihasas and your vedic scriptures to greater extent come into play the puranas and itihasas are been written or has been given to us in such a way to explain to us what is dharma what is adharma what has to be performed what does not to be performed and what is the way of life that one has to take when some you know we come to a junction of in life that we have to take left or right these are all been given through our puranas and itihasic texts so that is where we get the uh, what i call is that is where some people misunderstand even today that these itihasas and vedic scriptures are very very you know uh, uh, not applicable to this day and age but certainly it is not what happened in the uh, pages or what uh, what we hear from the stories of ramayana and mahabharata is happening every day the war which is happening today in some part of the world is the same situation what happened the war in the gurukshetra at 5000 years ago the same war which rama has to take over to establish dharma that he has to you know fight over the demon who was actually adharmic so it's the same old story coming to the point that we are asked about whether there is any live examples or whether there is something which we can take as an you know role model for this activity that is where many of the temples and the spiritual organizations come into picture see the temp the idea of instituting a temple is also to show to the people that you know you come here you understand about our you know uh, itihasas and puranas you understand about how to live a life today's temples have become stand alone places of worship unfortunately people go there spend 5 minutes or 10 minutes time and you know they think that you know we are just getting some some benefit out of it it's like a business activity i go to the lord ask for something i you know uh, throw some money to him and then he will do this for me unfortunately it is not the temples are Uh, i would call uh, universities 
which actually has to propagate dharma to people today it is not happening we are not able to spend time there nor the temples and institutions are not able to give out those dharmas to people and that is where the living examples or some of these examples which we need to have is actually all around even my our own examples of uh, international society for krishna consciousness iskon has established temples all across the globe i can tell today that we have temples in 180 countries including the most poor countries like somalia or you know all the african sub saharan countries or even everywhere dharma is needed everywhere it is not restricted to india it's not restricted to say nepal or sri lanka or something or the akanda bharat it is needed everywhere and some of these institutions are running very beautifully even today to actually show people that why dharma is very much needed how to do it practically the other example which i can also think of is uh, uh, the uh, dharmasthala a place in karnataka where there has been a tradition of you know many many more generations they have been practicing this you know uh, showing to people that you know how this dharma has to be practiced how dharma has to be done in a daily life and that is another example which comes to my mind which can be shown to the whole world that you know dharma is can be very very practical first one should also uh, read or hear and understand the uh, the history of dharmasthala the history of dharmasthala which started in the 10th 11th century ad how the dharma devatas came in how they established the system of you know how the dharma will be you know uh, maintained by the dharma adhikaris and how 20 generations not one or two for centuries 20 generations of dharma adhikaris have come hegdes have come and what they have done is they have still maintained the same uh, you know uh, duties and actions to maintain that dharma last time i had this good fortune to be there on the shankaranti day when a beautiful thing happens this is actually a very very important for any common man or even for the system as mr visa was telling even for the system to understand how they actually maintain this transparency the dharma adhikari puja hegde ji he goes on the shankaranti day and answers in front of the dharma devatas about his actions what he has done and what i understood is his actions are the answer the transparency in which all the actions are completely told in front of the dharma devatas that you know i have performed this i have done this dana i have taken care of this i have maintained the uh, total uh, uh, this thing of the entire community everything has been reported so that even the common man who has come to that uh, festival on that day hears out what has been done by the temple there is nothing to hide in dharma there is nothing to hide it's an open book and today it's an epitome of how transparency can also be established in any system today where today we are actually having lot of problems where people don't tell you transparently what they did some of the actions are kept very very opaque here nothing is you know kept anything opaqueness is not there everything is transparent the the the, uh, the person who is the dharma adhikari who goes in front of the dharma devatas and like a common man he answers small small questions and if somebody can get this opportunity to see it it shows that this place is still pure and still is the abode of dharma